Okay. 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 Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. This is not even a global pandemic will keep us away. <laughs> but do remember, we have a hybrid option, right? So if you ever want to beam into these going forward, especially we'll see what happens after spring break, um, we will keep it. We will keep it trucking. Uh, we're very lucky to have Professor Hans Klein join us today from uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, Professor Klein is doing a lot of interesting work in internet governance, but also, as we see here, on uh, information governance. Right? And as I learned at dinner last night, you have a whole background in this area, which I didn't fully appreciate, serving on the boards of lots of different uh, you know, community foundations, doing radio, television stuff all across the country. And I think maybe that was the germination of some of these ideas. Today, Professor Klein is going to be talking to us about information-based governance and cross-border information flows. Um, and I think it's going to be a lively discussion, which I'm really excited about. So uh, thank you for being here, Professor Klein. And the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, all of you, for coming here today. Uh, titled my talk, it's a little clunky, I apologize for that, Informational Governance and Cross-Border Information Flows, the Structural Alliance Between Domestic Dissent and Foreign Subversion. So uh, I'll give a disclaimer to start with here, and that is, uh, this is early stage research, and uh, what, what I gave, what was distributed here was a, I'd call it an extended abstract, it's a, not, not a full paper. Uh, the topic material here is a little bit uh, hot button issues in some ways. I get uh, interesting feedback from people I talk to. Sometimes I'm asked, uh, am I a Russian uh, agent? Am I a useful idiot? Because I sometimes say good things about RT. And we'll hear a little bit about that, the Russian television uh, network. Uh, am I an advocate of black ops? Because sometimes it sounds like I'm actually taking the subversive line, saying that that's, maybe we should consider that. And other times, because of my uh, sort of positive words about uh, dissent and f political fringe uh, viewpoints. I'm alternately uh, suspect of being a Trump supporter or a Sanders supporter. So you throw that all in together, plus some of the stuff, uh, it's tentative because it's early stage research. It's potentially a volatile mix. So, uh, yes, discussion welcome. Uh, personal <laughs> attacks, hold those for later. <laughs> Uh, over lunch, actually. Yes, over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. All right, quick outline. Three parts. I'll talk about governance, uh, particularly this idea of informational governance and the role of free speech and dissent in domestic informational governance. Uh, I'll talk about subversion, which is more the international perspective, the triangle of state and society, which are familiar from domestic governance, but throwing in external states, the role of foreign states in uh, domestic informational governance. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, ethical considerations. Uh, if truth is subversive, then what? What do we do? Does that mean that truth is bad, truth is good? How should we, how should we deal with this? OK, part one here, governance. Um, here's my, about the best, about as good as my graphics get on PowerPoint. <laughs> you think it worse from here on. Um, but uh, the basic uh, constructs of society and the state, the state and society, uh, the state governing society, society pushing back on the state. Uh, a very simplistic view here: uh, the state orders society, uh, and we're familiar. This is a, we're a center for governance. Obviously, we're all deeply interested in governance. I'm particularly looking here at national governance. So this isn't quite Ostromian uh, private governance, spontaneous associations. We're really looking at the state here. Um, classic rules of governance, the classic model is rules and, you know, rule making, rule enforcing through legislatures and the executive branch, and so on. Um, I'm looking here at an, a different way of governing, informational governance as I call it, uh, shaping the public sphere uh, that in turn shapes public opinion, that shapes behavior, that shapes elections. So uh, the state uh, in ordering society not only through rules and, and public rulemaking, but also through shaping the information and the interpretations and the narratives and so on that are available uh, to the public. And the tools, uh, and so this gets us, uh, as Scott said, much of my work is on internet governance, but here we're looking more at the community semantic governance, what, what, what's being said and the influences over what's being said and what becomes available in the public sphere, the total information and debate space. Uh, the tools for shaping information governance, governmental spokespeople in the most direct sense, but uh, news coverage and influencing of news coverage, uh, the education we receive uh, all the way from elementary school, the narratives that bind us all as Americans, if, if one can still use those, those terms these days, maybe that's become controversial. Uh, but you know, the, and the national myths and narratives that hold societies together, popular culture, influencing popular culture, the relationship between the state 
and uh, the movie industry, which has been widely documented, and shapes again uh, narratives of good and bad and perceptions and so on. And I'm looking at this, uh, probably the simplest place to look at information-based governments and the relationship between state and society. It's more obvious, I think, in foreign policy. It's, I think, the richest area for, for study, uh, in part because informational governance is most interesting when you have uh, state autonomy or elite governance in which decisions are more made uh, with less public input, and then uh, the informational governance is more to bring the public along with elite decision making. And in foreign policy, sometimes that is decried and sometimes that is celebrated. Some would say that foreign policy is appropriately autonomous or semi autonomous from domestic democratic publics. It's best left to, uh, to the uh, foreign policy experts and so on. So that's an area where you, I think you do find more. Uh, the, the need or the evidence of top-down uh, influencing of, of debates and news coverage and, and narrative and so on. So that's, I think, the, an interesting place to look at it. Um, techniques, and I mentioned these in, in the extended abstract, techniques of informational governance. Part of it is amplification. Uh, what, what, what facts, what information gets out to the public or, and is well known to the public? Uh, what facts get out there a lot? So we hear, here's an, an example, we hear a lot about uh, hacking. The United States is, 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 suffers a lot of information, cybersecurity risks, uh, particularly from China. It's in the news a lot. Uh, anybody knows that? If anybody here is unaware of Chinese hacking, please raise your hand. Uh, I'm going to give a hypothetical of filtering. You guys have been reading the news about the US penetration of Chinese networks, right? Mm -hmm. you, you heard of, it's a front page in the New York Times? Yeah, right. Well, no, I guess, no, I wasn't there. There was all the China story. Uh, so actually, recently there was a story where the Chinese complained, hey, you know, we get hacked too. Um, and I assume that our side is doing its side as part of national security. It's, I hope they're doing it. But uh, it's interesting that you can almost, you can look at the, the contrast in uh, what facts are, or get the facts of, of some countries hacking, you hear a lot of. The facts of other countries hacking, you don't hear much of. And that, uh, let me just put that out there as a, as a hypothetical possible that we're seeing the influence of amplification and, and filtering that sways public opinion. Uh, we're, we're under attack. Uh, we're, we're a victim in this situation. But uh, from the informational governance perspective, it's a way, perhaps, of getting the American public to support our efforts in, in international relations, to back up our side, and to be uh, concerned about the other side. Uh, amplifying, filtering. Uh, untruths, I'll use the word untruths. Sometimes uh, untruths play a role in, the, in, in influencing public opinion, getting people to go. Uh, it, some of the most uh, colorful examples come from uh, preparations, when the, in this case, the US examples, of preparing for a war or for armed conflict. Uh, there was a very famous case that we all know, the weapons of mass destruction, which was highly uh, amplified and really repeated and helped uh, build public sentiment in favor of the US uh, invasion of Iraq. But I don't know if you're, I assume many of you heard about the uh, babies and incubators in Gulf War I. How many of you are familiar with uh, the Saddam Hussein throwing babies, taking them out of incubators and putting them with nuts? Oh, that's interesting. Now, how many of you know that that was a construct of a public relations firm, you know, you know, yeah. very. It's it's for me because I remember the babies in incubators. President Bush gave a speech about it. The public outrage was incredible. You just think of babies, these vulnerable small human beings, being torn out of incubators. They needed medical assistance. Thrown on the floor by the invading Iraqi army in Kuwait is where this occurred, and the need for us to to, to stop that. Uh, so there's enormous public mobilization. Uh, there was a vote that U.S. authorized. The invasion of Kuwait, and then it turned out later. This is, it isn't very wide, widely known, but that was in fact what I'll call an untruth, uh, but a very influential one in mobilizing public debate. Mm -hmm. um, amplifying, filtering, untruths, uh, even narratives sometimes. Right? It's not necessarily how do we think about things. The world is a complex place. What are the narratives that we tell about uh, the world around us? One of them is we hear a lot about. Um, Democracy promotion, democracy assistance, the good work we're doing, whether it's in Afghanistan or, or, uh, or Iraq, or um, assisting, doing the best we can in, in Libya, or assisting in, in Syria, or in Ukraine. Uh, you know, we played a big role in trying to help Ukraine with democ exporting democracy and doing democracy promotion. 
Um, but that's an, a narrative, again, that portrays uh, international relations in a certain light that uh, certainly is open to challenge. Um, I know I found one of the most effective counter narratives, narratives to democracy promotion, I started here in Washington, D.C., is democracy in a box. Uh, is sort of the what's what the U.S. foreign policy is being accused of that there's a naive belief that you can roll into a foreign country, you open your democracy box, you say, "Hey, everybody, here's a copy of the Constitution. Okay, you're all citizens now. I guess there won't be any more civil strife, and everybody's going to have their rights." And that's a that's a, a corrosive kind of counter narrative, and in some ways illustrates the, the the use of narrative as it occurs in what I'm calling informational governance. So informational governance. Uh, this top-down uh, use of informational means to influence and somewhat to govern public through public opinion, through information, knowledge, and so on. Now we have uh, the pushback against that. At the, remember, I, I started with the state society. You have challenges to the state originating in society. Um, so society challenges the state. We have independent press. We have civil society, public intellectuals, radicals, if you will, because often. Uh, radicals in the true sense that they question what they're told. Radicals sometimes in the popular sense that they seems like, wow, they, they're they saying things, they're asking questions that are almost improper a little bit. But we do we do find, um, we find a societal pushback against informational governance. Uh, amp amplifying the filtered facts, counteracting filtering, reporting what, what doesn't get reported, uh, digging through what's being said, exposing untruths. Uh, challenging the narratives, coming up with counter narrative. That's the tension between a, a, a questioning civil society and a semi autonomous state <coughs> using informational means. Um, now, the uh, civil society challengers may experience difficulty getting their voices heard. Their access to the public sphere is traditionally quite costly. It gets you into the media business, it gets you into the technology business. Uh, Particularly historically, uh, our news media industry, the industry structure, is a small number of large corporations. That has started to change over time. New technology, as we've all experienced in our lives in the last 10, 20 years, uh, social media and so on, has, has changed. So already in the domestic sphere, in domestic governance, we're seeing changes as the, the, the capacity of top-down informational governance is being eroded by new technology and new social media, which is giving empowering a lot of uh, diverse voices, many more diverse voices than we've seen in the past. I don't know how many of you read blogs, news aggregators. A lot of international students will read the news in their home country, for instance, which is already getting different voices and so on. So we're seeing a certain technologically empowered empowerment shift in the balance somewhat uh, to the societal level, or there's new opportunities at the societal level to 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 influence informational governance and to, to balance the, the power uh, between uh, the state and, and society, between dissenters at the bottom and informational governance at the top. And so largely that's a kind of good narrative. Oh, that's wonderful. There's more voices being heard. There's more issues being raised. There's more dissent. Anybody who's reading democratic theory loves that's a good thing, dissent. There's even more protest. Well, you know, people on the street, that's, that's democratic. But at the end of the day, it weakens the state. Maybe that's what we're trying to do. It weakens the state, makes consensus at a national level more elusive, because now we have more voices out there. It may contribute to social unrest, people being dissatisfied. The narratives don't hold as much sway as they used to. At the extreme, we may have a crisis of governability. A society can have so many different voices, it begins to lose consensus. And, uh, and now we have. Uh, uh, a weakening of the state, the, the, the function of ordering society may break down, you have know, disorder. And sort of a question, is that a good thing, is that a bad thing? On the one hand, you know, it's more, more democracy. On the other hand, a weakening of the state, less social order. So it's a question. Okay, that's our domestic perspective on this. Let's take it now internationally and this term subversion that's in the title of my talk. So internationally, here's international relations in one slide. There are states and their rivalries towards each other. OK, you got it? Uh, whether the rivalry is warfare, it's diplomacy, it's economic rivalry, cultural rivalry, whatever. State one, state two, there they are facing off in, in rivalrous uh, relations. Now, there is an alternative 
to this arrow between states. One state, let's assume one state uh, has, would undermine or in some ways weaken another state, you can go head on, or you can take a more circuitous route uh, and go, a foreign state can make contact with uh, the society of another state, a society that is challenging its own domestic state. So we'll call this a, a foreign state uh, connecting with domestic society, challenging domestic state. And here it's, it could support civil society. Um, and how does it cross the border? How does it get across? Well, we have uh, just as, as new media, new technology has made it possible for within society to have a lot more communication. It's made cross-border information flows much easier as well. So states are having difficulty preventing cross-border information flows. Foreign states can now penetrate, can get communications uh, to the society in somebody else's uh, domestic territory. So you see information, cross-border information flows from foreign states to domestic publics in another society. And this can be used hence, uh, as a, in a subversive way to subvert a rival state. So the foreign state can, can support civil society and support democracy uh, in another state. Right on, it's great, we're supporting democracy. Uh, supporting the domestic challengers to another state. And this is, can be done by a variety of means, training, finances, and so on. Uh, at the extreme case, it can be done, you can support violent resistance as well. You can do training and military assistance, or you can provide news and public affairs. Uh, so I'm focusing here on the informational means that are used to undermine informational governance, right? I'm starting out, that's why I present, positing we have informational governance, and it can be undermined through informational means, and informational means cross borders pretty easily in today's world. So new media makes it easier to cross the borders. And uh, the technique you might see here isn't uh, so much, the, the foreign influence doesn't have to be so much the content, it's giving a platform. It's empowering the local groups, the civil society, the public intellectuals, the dissenters, the radicals, if you will, in another society, who in turn can keep doing what they've been trying to do, amplify the facts, expose untruths, critique the narratives, and so on. Things that are on the one hand sometimes celebrated, but here it's a two-sided point. There's also um, getting support. Presumably the interests of the foreign state are as much in interstate rivals, geopolitics, as they are in enhancing domestic democracy in other society. Okay, almost done because we want to have most of the discussion here. Uh, so here's a, a question. What are the ethics of this? Um, and I'll, let me say, I'm kind of torn on this myself. Uh, democracy, more democracy, more dissent, great thing. Huh, if you subvert a state to the point of civil war, to the point of riots, to the point of breakdown or order, hmm, is that a good thing? But it's democracy, it's free speech, but it's, it's disorder. What do you do here? So ethics here, you know, truth how many of you got this bumper sticker or used to? You know, truth is subversive, right on. Well, it, it, maybe it is. That's kind of the point. What uh, is truth good, subversion bad? Where do we stand on this? Truth is good for democracy. It's great to have a diversity of voices. It's great to hold your government accountable. Subversion, a weakening of national unity, vulnerability to foreign threats, uh, social disorder at the extreme, civil war, or I suppose a uh, foreign invasion or something like that. Um, you know, it's not so nice and it's not speculative because we have seen a kind of the combination of democracy promotion and civil wars have been going kind of hand in hand in a lot of countries these days. I'd say maybe Ukraine is a poster child of that for a violent civil war. And even in, within the United States, you know, obviously there's a kind of political, a uh, lot of verbal discourse conflict in our own society. So, um, so truth, is it good, is it subversive, and what do you think about that? Um, and uh, so I looked at uh, the case of RT Russia today. Um, it, it brings news and public affairs into the United States. Uh, it's, it's a $300 million per year news network, smaller than BBC or CNN. I don't know how it compares with Voice of America, Read for Europe in terms of budget. I should actually know that. Sorry, I don't. <clears throat> um, if you listen to our main media outlets, The Guardian, Time Magazine, New York Times, they'll tell you about Russia today. Brazen lies, it's a propaganda machine. It's that, you know, Vladimir Putin, who is almost as evil as Saddam Hussein, he, he's, he's trying to get, uh, to, to get us to have these terrible thoughts and ideas. Um, 
a little aside to what Scott was saying, I have a background in public access television, which was an early, ex a very local experiment in creating alternative media to allow more free speech and implicitly more dissent, more radical views into the public sphere. So I worked uh, with Cambridge, Massachusetts, Cambridge Community Television, People TV in Atlanta. I worked with Community Radio in Atlanta. And when I first encountered this cross-border news, which I didn't really know was cross-border, it's like, wow, this looks like what public access television was supposed to be. Look at these voices. These voices that you never read in the mainstream media are really uh, being given a platform here. So I got very interested in RT, and then it's, uh, it, it, I learned more about it. It's like, wow, this is a foreign-supported uh, platform for domestic dissent. How fascinating is that? And, then, and, and the more that Time Magazine tells me it's brazen lies and propaganda, or it's like, well, it doesn't, it looks more like brazen dissent rather than brazen lies. So um, we, we performed a content analysis um, of, uh, of RT. And um, the, well, we looked at their flag, we used a method that we use in other in analysis of, of US news media. Um, and we took their flagship show, kind of as a stand-in for all the programming, and we looked not what was said over 10 years, but what was who the guests were that were invited on this talk show. So instead of, instead of evaluating content, we evaluated the credibility of the speakers. And the assessment of the credibility of the speakers was, um, had they also appeared on other established media, CNN or Time magazine, or were they affiliated with a with a well-established institution, generally a university, elite universities, and so on? We found the majority of them sort of passed that credibility test, which is not to say you know RT is all truth. It's just to say the, the the claim that it's brazen lies I don't think holds up. There's a lot. There have been a lot of uh, pretty <coughs> solid voices. I don't know anybody from Indiana University. There are a lot of people in D.C. Georgetown, American University, appeared mm -hmm. a lot harder. So think tanks. Uh, political leaders, for, interestingly, former CIA, former State Department, with, with a lot of voices. So, um, so our, the, the kind of conclusion was it, it's RT. I won't say it's telling the truth. I'd say it's not obviously a lying machine. It's actually is a platform. What we what I call a dissent aggregator. I kind of compare it to on the left, the Nation. If you're familiar with that, the flagship left wing newspaper magazine, or the I'd say the flagship someone on the right, the American Conservative. It's it's well known. And in fact, there's a lot of the authors and speakers on those outlets also appeared in RT. So it seemed that, that RT, in, in my conclusion, was kind of a platform for dissent, not necessarily a, a, a big font of lies. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it may indeed, and, and whether you talk to the dissenters or perhaps even to the, to, the, to the Russian funders, it may subvert informational governance in the United States. Uh, and you do see these sometimes, you know, dissenters rebutting calls for a muscular response. You know, the, the kind of anti-war sentiment, amongst other things, is pretty common. Okay, so um, and RT. I looked at RT. There's lots of cross-border news flows that are uh, happening here. So there's RT, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio uh, Radio Liberty, Radio Marti, and so on. The U.S. also provides news and public affairs to foreign societies, and the U.S. is. is Clear. We provide journalism. We, we're not. This is not a. We're not telling lies. Um, commercial CNN, BBC. There's Al Jazeera going cross border. There's Venezuela's Telesur, Press TV from Iran, CGTN, which is from China, all disseminating. Uh, I, I think, and I haven't done content analysis, but I'm going to guess that a lot of these are not the kind of heavy-handed propaganda that perhaps they're, they're accused of. Uh, but they, nonetheless, they may all be undermining informational government governance. They may all be, in some ways, subverting the target uh, audience, and, and there may be that strategy behind them. So, uh, so again, we're stuck with this question. Sorry, um, truth versus subversion. What do you do? What do you, is there any way? Can we go any deeper than that? Here's a few speculative thought, thoughts. My last slide. You know, a criteria. When is it, when is the cross border dissent? <laughs> Cross-border supported dissent. When is it? When is it acceptable? It might be if we could evaluate the stability of a society. And I'm not saying I know how to do this. Uh, a more stable society can can have more uh, democracy, more dissent, more diversity of debates. Uh, a less stable society could be more vulnerable to this kind of technique. Could be more vulnerable to information subversion. So if we had a, a criterion for how vulnerable a society is, how stable it is, that might be one way to make an ethical decision as to whether how okay it is 
to, to provide cross-border news. So more stable societies, um, foreign supported dissent may be okay. I would actually say the U.S. is a pretty stable society as societies go, and therefore the provision of a foreign funded uh, support for domestic critics <clears throat> strikes me as actually kind of useful. I find it kind of useful to watch the, the radical voices on RT. Uh, unstable societies, new democracies and so on, where we've seen civil wars breaking out in part through pro-democracy efforts. I'd say there, it's, we, should be, we can be aware that it's easier to destabilize and maybe this push for dissenting voices and alternative divisive narratives is, is there. It's more dangerous and should be withheld or reduced. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for hearing me out. And I am very welcome to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, the floor is open. I might just have a, I might go be first, just a general question before we begin. Do you, do you have a particular end goal or audience or publication in mind for this project? Or is this just kind of a, here's the overall research agenda that I'm interested in? And, yeah, yeah. That might help well, I'm an academic. Discussion. I just want to get published well, in peer reviewed journals. Indeed, indeed. I don't yeah. care if anybody yeah. reads it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> a couple of things. Um, so I'm, talking to the people who are interested in alternative media. Mm -hmm. So I've, uh, some of the, and I'm actually, and I'm also talking to the people who are interested in support for uh, overseas resistance, resistance movements. Um, I'm trying, it's a difficult to stay, uh, you know, where do I stand in this? Well, when I talk to, you know, the guys who are interested in overseas democracy promotion, you know, I've, I've one of the audiences I've talked to has been the, the human rights community. And I said, listen, it's great to do human rights. It's great to do democracy promotion. But you have to, um, you really have to think, if, if you're getting that overseas assistance, uh, you have to try to clarify where do the interests, or where do the interests of domestic reformers align with foreign helpers? And where do they diverge? And how can you recognize? Should you just never take foreign assistance? Mm -hmm. Or are there criteria out there where you can say, yes, it's OK here, but not there? Or where, are, where do the interests diverge? For instance, here's an important one. It can be in the interests of a foreign state that you, civil society guy, kind of get slaughtered, um, which isn't very attractive if you're the civil society guy. Uh, so beware people who are like, yeah, attaboy, go get him. You go tell him more protests. Push it to the limit. Um, because sometimes political, ref political, even if justified, there's a pragmatic dimension to political reform. And you, you want to be pragmatically effective and not get, sometimes perhaps get too carried away ideologically. Whereas uh, there may be times if you can induce a foreign state to actually inflict violence on its own population, and then it's in every newspaper on yeah. the planet, from an interstate geopolitical, that could be a win, for a geopolitical win, even if domestically it's, it's, it's an unfortunate development. Mm -hmm. So there's some Plenty practical to pick up on. Yeah. <laughs> practical <laughs> concerns here. Oh, absolutely, yeah. OK, Mike, yeah, would you like to? Uh, yep, yep. Uh, it's yeah. interesting you mentioned audience, right? First, because I was, when I read this, which I found fascinating, uh, before to seeing the longer version of your, of your abstract, and so forth. but um, uh, was towards a policy audience. Mm -hmm. And the way you presented it here was a little more friendly, I think, to the general policy audience. And let me sort of give you a sense of where I was initially started from and where you sort of changed it. Mm -hmm. uh, the use of information, um, public dissemination of information, has long been one of the traditional tools, policy tools, in the policy instrument. Uh, you basically talked about this in the presentation, but not so much in, in the paper. Uh, you know, it's, it's right up there with taxes, subsidies, regulation, making laws. I mean, you, you get the list of Salomons and other peoples on the policy instruments, it's right up there. Uh, and it's seen as a legitimate public information kinds of, kind of stuff. But in your presentation here today, you framed it in terms of not, it's not so much just a um, policy tool, but it's an effort to shape the process of um, uh, in, inter information exchange or communication within a country, okay? Which makes it sound like it's a little more like regulation of markets or something like that, which is kind of a 
recognize the controversial part of our system, but it is part of our system. So we do regulate markets to try to protect them in some way. So it sounds like what you're talking about might be framed in terms of what level, what types of regulations should the national government have to try to shape the domestic policy discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that might be a way for you to frame that another point. Now, I've got a couple suggestions for that. Yeah. Um, uh, in your presentation, well, one of the things, um, I've taught a lot of courses in democracy and national security, so that's why I knew your example about um, um, uh, the Gulf Wars. I think it's important to point out that in that case, we were fooled by our ally, uh, by the Kuwaitis. There was somebody related to the Kuwaiti ambassador who, who basically <laughs> lied in Congress uh, in saying that these, they were pulling these babies out of the incubators. And it was a lie to get, to get us whipped up and stuff like that. So it's not just our enemies, it's sort of, you know, influence what we're doing. Uh, but another area that I've taught that, that I've never thought kind of really connected, but I see a connection through your work, is what I call religion policy in the United States. Now, it's not really a phrase that's used very much because supposedly we don't have religion policy, but we have lots of religious policies. Uh, public education, tied to in various ways, you know, medical care, all kinds of things. Uh, and there's been more research recently on trying to understand the religious policies in different countries. There's an, a lot of countries in, this, in, in the world are more explicit about it than we are in terms of they're starting to see it to be a legitimate aspect of public policy to shape the religious marketplace domestically. So there are a lot of countries, India is very strong about this, and Indonesia and a lot of the uh, um, Islamic countries, to basically restrict the level of uh, uh, proselytization um, efforts from, by foreign-based religions to come in and win converts to their religions, which are seen as a threat to the domestic religion. Mm -hmm. To me, that sounds an awful lot like where you're going in terms of subversion. That would be, that can be seen and has been argued as subverting the local religious market, the local culture, in the same way that, that you're talking about subverting the information sort of process. So that's an example that makes people, I think, be a little more queasy about the idea of interfering domestically. Whereas, you talk about regulating markets, it seems a little more normal kinds of stuff. And so it gives you a way to sort of have these two policy areas to sort of compare what you're talking about. Um, and another, one last thing I'll say, because I don't want to um, uh, uh, dominate too much here. Um, you did talk about the, the standard concept of the competitive market in ideas uh, and, and that being a, a critical aspect of democracy. Uh, because that's what you would be doing. You'd be regulating the market of ideas. Uh, and, but I think that helps justify it because you've got, in, in particularly in the Russian case, folks who are really good at this kind of stuff. I mean, the U.S. has been pretty good at it, too. We've done a lot of disinformation over the years, CIA, uh, and literal disinformation lying to interfere in, in, in elections, including some democracy. But, um, um, then the kind, the closer to what you're talking about, the kind of stuff in Radio for Europe, you're basically disseminating true information. It's just information that the governments don't want to be known to the population. Uh, so um, there's uh, an argument that can be made that foreign influencers have some sort of a competitive advantage over domestic influ influencers. And that that might be one reason to sort of you have even sort of a competition policy to make it more difficult for national gov for other governments to interfere domestically. We already have election finance laws that limit foreign contributions to campaigns, so that's another sort of uh, uh, connection here. In that you're you're you could ju partially justify this in terms of it's in the public interest to regulate the efforts of organizations like Russia Today, which I was scrolling through their website while you were talking, uh, and it's kind of interesting. I, I remember looking at Al Jazeera similarly years ago, kind of, it's kind of interesting. Uh, and, um, but, but I'm just trying to sort of give you a sense of some other policy areas yeah. that you could sort of bounce ideas off of and say it's, it's like this, but it's not, and it's like this, but it's not, and just sort of clarify the, the policy dilemmas, which are very real here, but they're actually more deeply political than they are just kind of technical kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. 
So great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are comments. I guess there's not a question there, but <laughs> yeah. Um, I think. Well, let me touch on just at least one of those. If we make a distinction between it would, you mentioned uh, policy instruments, right? Uh, so governance consists of a public, transparent, legitimate process for setting rules and, and ordering society. And then, it, and then it, there are the instruments by which those <clears throat> norms are implemented, which is essentially uh, social control. We often don't like to use the term, but they're social control mechanisms. Um, I think the informational governance, as I've portrayed it here, is maybe it divides between the use of information as a policy tool and this darker informational governance, is that the informational governance, uh, governance I'm talking about probably is not legitimate or is seen as less legitimate. So I did, there's at least one sentence in my abstract that addresses your point. It's like, well, there's a lot of, you know, somebody giving a speech is pretty wide open. They say, here's what we're going to do in the government, as opposed to um, the amount of news that's released to the media about what ch the China hacking versus not releasing American hacking. Mm -hmm. uh, that Presumably that's happening too, um, but from the outside it might be, hey, is that legitimate that we're not getting the full information, right? So it's that darker side of the, of the informational governance, or that dark side, which I'm calling informational governance here, um, that's vulnerable to truth telling mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a subversive activity. Right. Essentially, when you use um, illegit, when you govern by illegitimate means, you're potentially allowing your your rivals to be the white hats and to expose you. That's somewhat the dynamic, right? right? And so, uh, informational governance, particularly when it's information based and it's easier to expose, because now we have cross border information flows of the new technology, that this becomes a, a, a more powerful arena of, of of competition. As you you go into somebody's backyard. And you embarrass their government, and you, and right. that's what's really I think is this happening. And we see it around, um, you know, the Sochi Olympic scandal, right? Mm -hmm. So the Russians like, wow, these slime balls are cheating in sports. <laughs> that exposure, right? Uh, the DNC hack, presumably, was done by Russia. You know, it revealed, you know, there was real malfeasance within the Democratic Party. So this cross-border exposure is is I think a, you know, a growth area in international relations. Uh, Gustavo, so, yeah, what did you guys do? So, well, I think it's a fascinating topic. It's my, my first question is, um, are you talking about, so what are these foreign players? State actors or non-state actors? Because I think the things could be very different, no? Mm -hmm. uh, second, um, I think it would be very interesting to, <coughs> before going to the ethic or normative part, having a theory of influence. So essentially, when some foreign actor has an incentive to invest resources to change uh, the information available for uh, society in a, different, in a different state. And I think what you get there as a positive theory versus a normative theory could be very different. For example, those cases are very unstable. Is all, there are also the cases in which you have higher capacity to change things. So maybe you have more incentive to uh, influence in those cases rather than in cases that are pretty stable, no? Uh, but maybe the cases that are pretty stable, like, you know, maybe the US, are more valuable because they have more leverage at the international level. So there is a trade-off there on uh, the actors that are trying to influence. Um, my final point is I would also think that it's important to see the connection between domestic interest and uh, foreign uh, intervention, no? It's like, in some of these cases, it's uh, there were decisions taken that affected domestic players. It's like uh, if you have more information, let's say on the Iraq war, then maybe you change the support for the Iraq war, and that has important domestic consequences for taxes, military, blah blah. No? So it's like there is a connection there that I think is it's worth exploring between the the domestic players. The domestic citizens and what kind of information you are receiving and what kind of information the foreigners are, are getting. And one thing I believe it's in, it's it's important is that if if you allow your government to do some things on foreigners, well maybe once they have the technology and no check and balances on that, 
what restrict them to start doing it with your own domestic citizens? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the long-term uh, problem with, I think, uh, human rights on domestic players versus foreigners. No, it's like where do you put the where do you cross where, where do you put the line? No? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I am dealing with state actors, and I think state my actors. my logic has to be state actors. Well, maybe it doesn't. I, so I haven't thought. I, I've assumed it has to be state actors because my fundamental exterior dynamic is in the international arena, in international society, state to state relations. I haven't really thought about what if what about a foreign. We did have the case. All, you know, you could discredit a foreign corporation. You know, Sony uh, was discredited. They they hacked the emails. They doxed Sony and revealed all this racist emails going on, which is very damaging to a corporation. So this is kind of interesting. Maybe this is another growth area in business competition is to do exactly the same thing, right? Hack and expose, embarrass, discredit the governing regime of a private corporation um, and possibly using a human rights agenda. In fact, that might be a rich area. If you look at some of the recent, uh, you know, I, Actually, you know, the Harvey Weinstein case, if you go back to the origins of Harvey Weinstein, it was a battle for control of his corporation. <laughs> and I think that this, I'm going deep in some trivia here, but I believe it started uh, with, he was, a, the original exposure of Harvey Weinstein might have been as part of a struggle over control of the corporation. For further research, I don't want to go on record here yeah. uh, on it. You are. Uh, There's no record. You are. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just between us. You know, the, 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 it's unstable states. Uh, okay, well, yeah. unstable states. Hey, the great thing about unstable states is they're much easier to intervene yeah, exactly. than stable states. So, um, right. So that's the pause. If you're purely in a geopolitical framework. Uh, you'll get more bang for your buck when you can really uh, topple somebody. From an ethic, and, 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 and again, I even said a civil war could be seen as a win on the outside because you've now, let's say you have a, a state that's a hostile state on day one, and 100 days later they've got a civil war. Guess what? They're not that, you know, they're, they're kind of busy, busy now. The Lebanonization is the term sometimes used of different states where you have potential hostile states and one after another they, they're tangled up in civil wars. So Libya is not much of a threat to anybody these days. Syria is not much of a threat to anybody these days. Um, and some have argued that that's actually a win for, in geopolitical terms. Um, now the benefit, you know, you go for the big ones, even the stable ones, the benefit's potentially higher. That's certainly here in the United States, it, it, the, the mainstream discourse is is along those lines that uh, there is a threat in the United States to this cross-border influence operations, and uh, and uh, so there was a, a major report by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, FBI report in January 2017. You might remember it was played a big role, but it spent quite a bit of time saying RT is a threat to American uh, national defense. So um, it was, I didn't necessarily find it that convincing, but somebody at the governing level thought it was important enough to give it a high degree of attention. So it's taken seriously in the U.S. Awesome. We have uh, Andy, did you want to? Yeah. Okay, so, and then yes, and then Julie. So, um, I read this, so I read this with interest mostly because I um, am always intrigued to read a slightly different take on my perspective of the world. And um, I, I would just like to encourage you to unpack this, I guess. So I started with the question of what is truth? And I don't want to hear what the U.S. government tells me. And I wonder if what you really mean is truth plus narrative plus actions is what you're trying to measure. So, you know, it's one thing for me to shout fire, which might be truthful, unless everyone runs in the room and realizes it's a smoldering trash can that we could easily put it out. So, you know, to me, there's more to what you're talking about than just merely truth. And I think you're trying to encapsulate a lot in this concept of truth and if you unpacked it, it would lend um, to your paper a lot. So I'll give you an example. In such a, uh, page five, in such a society, subverting governance, even if done with truthful information, may be unethical as it will cause chaos and conflict. Maybe, um, fair enough, but I, I disagree. Um, I think it very well may subvert governance, especially if it's coupled with um, other supporting narratives and action on behalf of the 
um, dissident stir. So, you know, I wonder if, if you begin to bring some of that other research in, because it sounds like you know it, but I don't see it in here, and you said it was an abstract, so that's not surprising. But I wonder if that credibility and all of those things get packed in here too quickly, and if you unpack them, they'll give you a, a more rich um, support for some of these things. The other thing is, um, I've grown to hate the word ethical. I also, just like I don't know what truth means, I have no idea what ethical is either. It's been bastardized way too much um, by too many people and used as a weapon, not as a as something that we should all as a society be adhering to. And so, you know, I, I would just, I would sort of think of other words for some of those things, right? I'm not sure it's unethical to tell the truth ever. And we can talk about that forever. I'm uh, sure. Yeah, I think there's probably literature on that. But that's, yes. I think Tom has something to and, say on that. You know, the church would might agree. You know, I mean, there's thousands of different. But I don't think you need any of those words, I guess is my point. Uh -huh. I don't think you need it. I don't think you need to talk about whether or not the information is truthful. Maybe it's just simply accurate. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, and then, what, then we can talk about accurate, and in the context of the narrative that surrounds the accurate information, maybe you're actually more interested in the, in the narrative that surrounds it. So fire is true, right? Uh -huh. If I shout fire really loud, that's true. It's the shouting that maybe we should be worried about. Mm -hmm. And when you start talking about credibility and all those things, I think that's what you mean. Because if I stand, or Scott stands in the hall, or Mike, <laughs> actually there's several people here, Bernie, who stand in there and start shouting fire, a lot more people will respond, trust me, <laughs> than a quiet, meek person who no one's sure what you're talking about. So I, I think authority, uh, all of those things build into that measure of credibility that, that I, I think is missing from here. And I think you try to capture it in truth, and I actually don't think truth Truth just makes it too simplistic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and immediately turns me off of the conversation because I refuse to believe I, I've had enough of the U.S. telling me what truth is. It's crap if I'm standing in another country. I don't want to hear it's truth. It's either accurate or not. Uh -huh. And it's accurate at the time the message is given. And that's the only thing we should expect. Right now, this is what I know about the virus. It's accurate right now. It's now different. <laughs> it was truth both times. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think that's what you mean, and I think if you can pull some of those words out, I get it. So we use robots and all kinds of funny. I mean, we get published as well by using all you know. Those are the buzzwords. <laughs> ethics is in every my title. I don't talk about ethics, <laughs> uh, but I think it would it would it would give you a breadth of this that matches more what you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it does, you know that. At the end of the day, we're looking at the policy instrument. The, yes. This communication. As a actually yeah. communication is social control in its crudest sure. terms, right? Yeah. So social control, like, hey, I want everybody to get out of this room fast. Right. So I say, hey, you know, there's a fire. Yeah. There's a fire. It's, or yes. Scott, please, you yell, there's a fire. Any one of these will have different effects in in an attempt to influence behavior and change what people do. Yes. So I think you're, I, yeah, I see what you're saying to, to, fully understand the nuance in which a word or a, you know, a fact or a, yeah. whatever it is. Co uh, translates into social ordering, ordering yes. and training. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. From our professor of business law and ethics. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the title. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks for the presentation. So, this is what I heard you say. You, you presented foreign policy as the context of your speech, mm -hmm. and you identify the states as the main actors, but your states are not actually black boxes. Your states are influenced by intrastate, you know, actors. So they are not really, so you're looking at the relationship between, um, you know, intrastate actors, you emphasized ideas a little bit, you know, between ideas, and, but you're looking at the relationship between, uh, you know, uh, foreign policy and ideas. Mm -hmm. Now, when I heard that, if I'm right, there's a branch of you know, international relations and foreign policy where I, you know, it would have been good to see theoretical frameworks developed from, it's called ideational liberalism. So, because I think it's been around for quite a while, mm -hmm. since the 1990s. And I, I'm sure there are theoretical frameworks that have been built to like develop. So, mm -hmm. what I felt missing was some form of theoretical framework that can underlie the 
measurements. Mm -hmm. um, so, would Francis Fukuyama be an example of ideational liberalism? Do you know? Uh, I mean, no, has I he sort of, that's what, that was in some ways. The Andrew Moralschik is like a liberal example. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know. Um, well, taking preferences seriously. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, one view of what I'm looking at, there has been cross-border news and democracy promotion abroad aren't quite exactly the same thing, and I've kind of struggled with that, right? So I often kind of fudge one into the other, because there's, there's uh, in the case of RT, it's it's pretty much purely an informational conduit. Going in the other direction, um, yeah, we have our media, but in some ways the, the most action has been under the category of democracy promotion rather than information conduits. So the two, the two kind of intertwine. Um, and since the 1990s, uh, this, there has been obviously the I think what I think it was in Fukuyama, this very strong ideological approach that has, I've characterized somewhat as the democracy in a box. That's like, okay, history's taking us all towards uh, democracy. It's the natural inevitable endpoint of history. Uh, and it's the United States is gonna help other countries get their, achieve the endpoint of history a little faster. And here's our solution. I got the box for you right here. Um, I think the, that has now been shaken that, that simple belief in how to, and how political development occurs, frankly. Uh, that political development is much more complex, it's much more organic, it's much more context dependent. And uh, so in some ways, the dynamics of cross-border, uh, even democracy promotion, I think is it's less attractive. Maybe our foreign policies are moving on to other um, ideological approaches to, to foreign policy. But I, I, I guess Fukuyama was, you know, based his logic on, uh, you know, German philosophy. Hegel. Uh, Hegel yeah. and so the, the, the ideational liberalism that I'm talking about is, uh, you know, ideas that are a little bit different from, uh, you know, the uh, Fukuyama. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Andrew uh, Moralschik would be like, Okay, we can I will look more that. during lunch upstairs. Right. That sounds great. I just want to make sure a bit of a lightning round if that's okay, guys. Maybe we'll get several. But I think Jillian, you're next, and then we'll work our way across the back as well. Yes, please, Jillian, first, and then we'll maybe we'll get. Let's let's go ahead and get all four. Okay. <laughs> maybe we can make some notes. Okay. Yeah. And then you can <laughs> Throw them at me. If you would like Come on, to. bring them on. <laughs> yeah. Or five. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a really good uh, presentation. I admire your courage for choosing such a topic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful for that comment. So you know I'm Chinese. That declares all my uh, ideological bias. <laughs> You're one of those hackers I've been reading. About. I think Angie for uh, raising the question, uh, which is my first question also, um, about the definition of truth. And from a journalist perspective, uh, there are several things that, that, that could be clarified between truth, facts, and the term that you president invented, alternative facts. Mm -hmm. domestic information networks, uh, if uh, the truth or facts conveyed by these foreign information networks are more subversive than the domestic ones, and how maybe you, um, uh, how we could uh, maybe try to reduce uh, our personal ideological biases as researchers, in your case, you and your team, uh, in uh, making this uh, Not so much between facts and, and non 
effect, but rather which kind of information serves which political preferences? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good points. And we'll, we'll work our way around, so yep. please. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned uh, about full, full, uh, you mentioned about full, full, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay. You mentioned about full, full, I think, blockchain ideology about, I think, about his, his famous book about the end of the history, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing. If we look at back to the history, I think when we stick on the one that ideology, I think sometimes it's really dangerous, right? I think, by, for example, if we look at that, um, a lot of country like the US promote for democracy and through a lot of governments around the world. But what's going on? But I think in this case, I'm, I'm doing a research about Vietnam War re, re, recently. I think it directly related to your works. I think that the, what incident happened, I think, for the Vietnam War between US and Vietnam. And the US pay very costly price and Vietnam to another country. So that is the incident of the Tolkien Gulf. Yeah, Gulf right? That is that the wrong one, right? But at that time, the US government misled the you have public my question is how to avoid that such mm. situation because when a lot of government around the world yeah. they meet let the public and then they have done a lot of bad things around yeah. the world so how to deal with that yeah that's no, a good point as well and yes yes please Love yes. Talk. and i was general question have you ever run into censorship as you you're looking at this at this area yeah. Good, yes. Good self censorship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I kid you not. I am yeah. dead serious. Yeah. Dead yeah, yeah, serious. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if if the case of the big television sta stations is the good one. It's a good example of the process you, uh, that you are talking about. Uh, and I have two arguments against. Mm. Uh, one is at this. In the, case, in the case of some of these television stations, their goal is partly not, not, not only to influence the, the, the view of the other country, but also to present a new picture, uh, to, to alter the, uh, the affected uh, picture of its own region. Role. Yes, so, uh, and the question is whether they are also truthful in this case too. Uh, I don't think so. And, and, and uh, so uh, that's. Uh, they are so truthful in terms of, of uh, uh, like foreign policy and affecting the, the, the view of a foreign country, maybe because that's not the, the only goal of, the, of, uh, of this information station. Mm -hmm. And it's also to create the information about their own mm -hmm. country and region. And the other argument is that uh, I think providing false information uh, and signing it with its own name, like in, in your own station, proved ineffective as a, as a subversive strategy. And so it, it is much more effective to create the false content and make it spread in other ways, mm -hmm. like without the possibility of identifying the source. So, uh, uh, so I would, only, I would even make the hypothesis that with time, the content of this large source of information will, will, will converge in the sense that they, they <coughs> become more and more similar in what they present because, they, because the subversion is done in other ways. Yeah, it's it, it's not effective to to to, to make subversion like uh, with presenting the false news about about the, the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who would you like to comment on that? Cool. Okay. Thank you so much. Are you okay? Uh, well, maybe afterwards. Yes. Please. Okay. I'll, I'm going to be sum that up. <laughs> uh, quick here. Um, so uh, any no particular. So it's just because you just, you just mm -hmm. asked the false news. Um, RT. It's interesting. I, uh, RT doesn't present that much on Russia. I think it might have earlier, and its mission is to present Russia to a foreign audience. And I found <coughs> they took a lot of flack for that early on in their portrayals of the uh, Russia annexation of Crimea. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was a turning point, but there isn't much about Russia on RT. It's almost all Americans talking about Americans on a Russia-funded platform. Um, and that may they may have concluded that that's a more effective way to do it. I mean, there's a little bit. Um, they cover Russian athletes. Um, there's a certain amount. It's like reading, you know, the British newspapers. There's like topless 
women on page three. There's a little bit of that in RT. They're, they clearly have a kind of sex appeal marketing going on a little bit there. Um, occasionally they'll say, oh, here's an, this is kind of propagandistic. Here's a new hypersonic missile that Russia has developed. Isn't that amazing? Which is like, wow, this just feels like the Cold War. Uh, that doesn't happen very much. It's, it, although when it does happen, it's like it's off the charts in terms of, am I supposed to celebrate a new weapon from Russia? <laughs> um, but mostly they don't talk much about Russia. They talk about the US. Um, then which do they pick stories that are more subversive when they cut that are more subversive? I think they probably do. Uh, if you'd say what's Russia's number one uh, subversive thing would be to promote anti-war and pacifist sentiment in, in rival states. Mm -hmm. So they, there's a lot of critics of U.S. foreign policy on our team. It makes perfect sense. That's even you know even the Soviet Union and, and, and was was the same way. Uh, give the, give voice to the pacifists. Um, the the Gulf of Tonkin incident is another uh, classic. It, it gets on the list. Gulf of Tonkin, babies in incubators, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you know those are the ones we know about. Uh, there's probably others that. I believe, and there's historians who write about it and academics who, who discuss it where maybe they were made up too. I assume that, that for every one that's been detected, there's been a number that have flown right past us and that we, we swallowed hook, line, and sinker. Uh, how to avoid that kind of thing? Get more critical voices. Get the people out there uh, and give them a voice. It's not that the facts aren't known, it's that they don't, there's, there's a world of, of what is known and there's a world of what is known in the public sphere. And it's really that second step that that's the, the battleground we're looking at here. So uh, a couple people knew, you know, these days many people know about the Gulf of Tonkin. Not that many people know about the babies and incubators. That, that really never penetrated the public sphere. I'm sure I could do a poll of the American public and you get 90, of the people who know about it, I'm sure 95 to, I bet 99.5% of people consider it to be a true fact and are unaware that it's well known that it's not. But it, that, the, the critique never made it into the public sphere. Censorship uh, is a really big deal. So people sometimes ask me, well, where's this censorship? You know, how can you censor New York Times? It's independent. How can you censor academics? They're tenured, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. So one thing about studying propaganda is you become your own little laboratory. You know, you read RT all day, and then you look at yourself in the mirror and say, what are your new attitudes towards war and peace that's applying? And it's like, well, uh, actually, they're kind of different, you know? Uh, and and uh, hey, Professor Klein, you, I hear, understand your research says that RT's great. Are you going to write an op-ed in the New York Times that this professor now says RT is good when RT was white hot four, three or four years ago? And I was like, you know, some of this research has been sitting on my back burner for a long time because I was afraid, afraid to go public with it. You know, even colleagues, they frown and they're uh, So you get, you get a feedback. So um, in terms of the information space, even independent actors like myself are influenced by, you, you know what you can say and what you can't say. And in the United States, we sometimes hear that about China. I've read in the New York Times that Chinese censorship, much of it is self-censorship. Oh, China's bad. But in fact, I would say even among us in this room, think of to yourself, have I ever self-censored myself? My answer is yes. Yeah. And maybe it's the same for some of you here, too. OK, well, thank wonderful. you. Have another round of applause for the rest of your Reminder, guys, we do have a research series on Wednesday with Greg Blue, uh, which is going to be great. Mm -hmm. Next week, though, spring break and pull